La diffusion vient de démarrer. Tous les participants sont en mode écoute seul. Good morning everyone and good afternoon to those of you in a different time zone. This is Amelia Greenberg with SPTF. Uh, welcome to this webinar. We're very excited to have you here. Uh, Isfaris Vollingham of MSC is going to be presenting and also Alex Rizzi of Smart Campaign. But before we get into the content of today's webinar, just a few reminders about logistics, please. The first is that we're going to keep you on mute to avoid background noise. We strongly encourage your questions and comments, but we ask that you uh, write them in the chat box and then we will get to them in the Q&A portion uh, at the end of the hour. So uh, you'll find your chat box on the right of the screen. Again, please put your questions or comments there and we, we welcome them. So uh, whenever they occur to you throughout the presentation, just go ahead and type them and then we'll get to them in the last 20 or so minutes. Um, the webinar is recorded as you saw on the screen and we'll also be able to share the slides by posting them on uh, Microsave's website. So you'll have access to the material that you hear today. And in addition, the full report uh, is on the website. So on this slide here, you see your speakers. We can keep going. Um, and I think, um, yeah, as we go ahead, here's the agenda for today. We're gonna give you a brief overview of the study. In the interest of time, that's gonna be quite brief. Uh, and then we're gonna spend the bulk of the time today talking. Isfri will share with you the key insights that came from this research. Um, and then the calls for action that we uh, pulled based on the findings from the research. And then of course, the time for Q&A. So next slide. So first for the study approach, um, we wanted the study to answer the three questions that you see here on the screen. First, what is the state of digital credit in Kenya? And two, how has the supply side landscape evolved? And what are the challenges that we see um, with the supply? And then three, who are the digital credit users? And what is their experience with the products? And we ask these about Kenya, as many of you know, because it is such a developed market for digital finance. But the idea is that by understanding Kenya's experience over the past years, then that will teach us lessons about what to do and what not to do elsewhere. So uh, the, again, the bulk of what we're going to talk about today is, is what we hope would be broadly applicable lessons pulled from the experience of Kenya. And the study was funded uh, through SPTF's uh, Responsible Microfinance Facility, which AFDA supports. And uh, the donors and all three of these entities on the call today, MSC, Smart Campaign, and SPTF, felt it was quite urgent to do this study because of some challenges and some risks that we see um, in, in the digital credit space, particularly. So first is insufficient regulatory oversight. And uh, that is a um, fine line to walk because we want to have enough room for innovation and new ideas without stifling that through a heavy regulation, but also um, with, with too little regulatory oversight, a lot of bad behavior is possible. So um, that is occurring and we wanted to explore exactly why and how and, and what to do. Also high rates of delinquency. We note that in digital credit, delinquency is much higher than in traditional credit and uh, it's unacceptable. Uh, also interest rates are very high and this is um, the, the, a lot of the arguments in favor of digital finance, in addition to the facilitation of outreach, are that it's more efficient and the provider um, spends a lot less money on a lot of its processes and systems, and in that way, the cost of providing credit can go down. And it is true, but yet we're not seeing that cost savings translated to clients. So we need to figure out why and, and what we can do about that. Also, the lack of channels to understand the needs of marginalized customers. We still see um, people who are excluded, what we call the digital divide. So even as the numbers of people with access to bank accounts grow, there are certain segments of the population that, that are excluded, and we need to understand why they're not being uh, included in this, in this new wave of, of credit and finance. And then inadequate customer protection practices, uh, in addition to all the ones that we have in traditional finance with the digital age, there are a lot more uh, new kinds of challenges around data privacy and data security. And also with the lack of touch or the reduced amount of touch, some of the 
um, consumer protection practices that traditional finance has started to do well in terms of um, interacting with clients and giving them a mechanism to give feedback have been reduced in the new environment. So we're seeing worse customer protection in certain um, aspects of, of uh, interactions with clients. And then uh, the confusion and dissatisfaction in the user experience, um, providing information without human interaction in a way that facilitates comprehension and comfort and learning is, is a big challenge. So we wanted to learn um, how what's not going well and also to think about what could be going well. And a really interesting part of the study was looking at different interfaces that different providers use and trying to pull from that the lessons about what's what's easy to understand, what's easy for clients to use, what isn't easy and what's not working well. So with that, I will turn it over to Isfari to, to dive into more of the details of the study itself. And again, please uh, put your questions in the chat box. We look forward to hearing your reactions and additional questions. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. And if you have any issues um, with sound, please also indicate that in the questions box. So on to the presentation. Um, as Amelia has shared, uh, the research covered both supply side as well as demand side analysis. And I will start off discussing some of the key supply side insights. Many of us who work in Kenya or have been following the market um, here know that Kenya has made remarkable progress uh, in financial inclusion in the last years. Uh, we're talking about an increase of 62% uh, in the last 13 years. And there's no denying that much of that has been fueled by uh, the mobile money revolution in this country, beyond payment and now also in the digital credit um, space. So digital um, credit, as you can see, uh, We'll see that in the next slide, but digital credits are issued by three broad categories of players. Uh, we have the MNO and bank partnership, you have banks, and you also have fintechs. Lastly, there are also some MFIs which are moving towards more digitized modes of uh, lending. And as you can see, from 2014 to 2018, the percentage of digital loans um, has virtually uh, doubled uh, in the last four years. 77% of borrowers have only taken uh, digital loans. And in our conversations with uh, the traditional players, such as banks, uh, many of them have noted that most of their loans are now being uh, issued and processed through their digital, digital channels, such as their apps. It is worth noting here that we're talking about volumes and not value. Uh, the value of traditional loans are, are of course still much higher um, as this captures also the much larger loans uh, given to uh, the commercial sector and corporates. The good news is that the product is certainly making an impact in terms of access to credit, uh, but there are certainly some red flags. Microsafe Consulting has called some of these out in the previous analysis of the sector that we did two years ago. The first conclusion then was that there is a high default rate associated with this product. That conclusion hasn't uh, changed, unfortunately, although we note that the number of individuals who are blacklisted as a result of these defaults has dropped. It stands at 2.2 million borrowers uh, who are negatively listed. Correspondingly, 16% of uh, digital loans are non-performing. So if you compare them to traditional loans, this is three times worse uh, in performance. Um, if we look at the chart here, it's clear that uh, you know, the MNO facilitated banks are the clear uh, market leader. Um, if you look at the total number of loans, followed by banks and thereafter the fintechs, um, as mentioned before, MFIs are lending through more digitized channels, but we wish to highlight that these are not, for example, identical to your, you know, MSHWARI loan, uh, which is immediate, and completely automated, um, typically much smaller loan value. Um, and I think that's, this is sort of an important point to note uh, ahead of a discussion on regulation of players in this sector that, that uh, we'll talk about soon. So as mentioned, the good point is that we're gradually seeing a decrease in NPLs. And apart from uh, you know, an overall dip, uh, a dip in overall loans uh, issued 
that was there in 2017, the number of loans have doubled between 2016 and 2018, and this is quite significant. Um, and significant also because uh, the NPLs have correspondingly decreased uh, by 15%. Uh, we break this down further in the full report by institution, and the biggest gains have been seen by the MNO facilitated players, who are also the most dominant players. And um, we attribute this uh, result largely in improvements uh, in their credit scoring algorithms. And yes, they are the first mover. Um, so they have had quite some time to work on that. Um, but also, you know, uh, the, the level of access that they have to customer data, um, I think, far surpasses any other player in the market, um, unless, of course, they get it from um, this, the MNO. And in, in, in Kenya, we know Safaricom uh, is, a, is a big market player and has is, is started selling uh, uh, its credit scores to other providers in the, in the market as well. The second major finding, you know, two years ago when we looked at the sector was um, the MPLs that we're seeing, the majority of them were for very, very small loans. That uh, still holds, unfortunately. Our analysis of data from 2016 to 2018 shows that um, almost, you know, 840,000 borrowers are blacklisted for under $10 balances. Um, defaults are a bad thing, yes, uh, but you know, negative listing actually has a much larger impact than one's ability to just ac access credit. Um, in fact, most job applications require a, a clear CRB rec record. Um, and, and the reality is that those who are negatively listed have to pay uh, an amount equivalent to 22 US dollars to get delisted, um, which can sometimes be more than the amount that they actually uh, owe. So, I mean, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, there is quite a bit of hassle in terms of um, getting yourself delisted. Um, and there is also a sort of emotional impact on borrowers, uh, which we'll talk about a bit more when we, when we look at the demand, demand side findings. So going back to my earlier point on regulations, it's also important to look at uh, the newest players on the block, uh, the fintechs. You know, they're certainly innovative players. Um, they are still unregulated. And in, in Kenya, at least, there are a really diverse set of players. Uh, it's not a homogenous market at all. In this one category, we have firms like Tala, Branch, who have an international footprint. They operate in many markets, including Kenya. Uh, but you also have much lesser known um, entities that pop up one day and you know a few couple of months down the road you don't hear about them um, essentially though all of these fintechs are offering uh, the same type of product uh, if we should we should make a mention that there is varying um, customer protection practices uh, but this general category is still associated with very high interest rates uh, uh, for for the loans um, there are two worrying trends that I wanted to call out. Uh, one is first the significantly higher NPLs um, that we see at fintech. So this is the dark blue box that we're looking at. Um, and in, in, this, in this supply side data that we have analyzed, we, we only see that of fintechs that have uh, actually chosen to report uh, you know, their data, um, which, is, which is not many of them, um, as, as the, most of them are not regulated. Um, when we look at the borrower uh, data, borrowers at these institutions um, also appear to be less disciplined uh, with more negative loans uh, compared to at the other institutions. Um, and this can also be linked to the lower touch involved with uh, a lot of the processes that, that fintechs use. So um, Amelia mentioned this point earlier, and um, you know I think one of the biggest promises of digital anything is that because of the scale that we're able to reach and the efficiency of processes, we will be able to bring the prices down. Um, however, we have yet to really see that uh, in digital credit. Um, one. Something to note about Kenya, there is an interest rate cap, uh, you know, at 13% per annum, but non-bank DFS providers still can and do charge high interest rates. So, um, 
M Shari, for example, uh, charges a fee of 7.5% of the loan value for a 30 day loan. However, this rate doubles if not paid in one month, and then it effectively translates to an APR of 90%. Uh, looking at the banking sector, equities uh, cost to customers is 10% per month, um, uh, despite the interest rate cap of 13% per annum. Um, and we know you know, uh, from our conversations that most of equity banks uh, digital lending is through its M MVNO channel. Um, so this is the Equital product. Um, KCBs and PESA, for example, uh, offers a 6% rate on a 30 day term, uh, but deducts the cost of borrowing upfront, which is which is also uh, uh, not something that that that's, let's say, uh, regulatorily prescribed. Um, so I mean, we we do we do see uh, you know a huge range. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the fintechs are are much uh, on the higher side. Uh, most of them above a hundred percent, with the exception of one player branch, which uh, has a varying APR uh, uh, by varying the interest rates that are offered uh, with successive loan cycles. So that that's one example of uh, you know this decrease of of price that we were hoping to see. So I'll move on now to uh, some of the key demand side insights uh, that came from our interviews. So we spoke to a total of fifty respondents who are regular users of the product. Um, separately, we also conducted a mock exercise where uh, effectively what we did is we sat with a group of 21 respondents, um, tested four key products in the market. These were Tala, KCB and PESA, uh, HF Wiz, uh, as well as OPESA. Um, and we, we used this exercise to uh, evaluate usability. And we'll, we'll talk about um, some of the key findings uh, in a later slide. So as, as highlighted earlier, there is high uptake of the product. And what we understand from the latest Findex data is that it's also one of the many tools used by digital borrowers. Many digital borrowers, in fact, already have a, ba a bank account. Um, they also rely on informal channels for borrowing. Um, the data shows that there is a trend of multiple borrowing. 60%, the 62% of digital borrowers had more than one uh, digital loan with each uh, digital borrower having an average of uh, three loans. 60% um, of digital borrowers have just borrowed from one provider, which means that 40% have actually borrowed from uh, multiple sources. Um, and very often, uh, you know, digital borrowers have a traditional loan uh, and often also have an informal loan that's, that's not captured in the supply side data. One of the, the important lines of investigation in this research was also if digital credit was reaching all uh, in need of credit equally. And, you know, um, we also wanted to ask this question, is, is it even uh, uh, causing a digital divide or furthering this di digital divide? Um, we know from existing body of research, uh, uh, which has shown that borrowers are typically young male, um, in fact, not from the, the lower or lowest income segments um, that are underserved. Um, our research confirms this in terms of gender and age. There is a gender gap of 26% and women we spoke to express more uh, reservation around the uptake of, of newer products. Um, Lower income women in particular were uh, relying heavily on uh, peer influence to try a new product. Uh, there were also some insecurities expressed around the technology, um, the process of trial and error, as well as you know, disclosing a lot of the personal information that is uh, required by many providers, things like phone records, photos, um, and so on. The demand side um, conversations also yielded a number of key observations on client protection and empowerment uh, uh, issues, which, which were the key objective of this research. And we discuss um, the key ones in the next three slides. First, we'll look at product and liability awareness. Um, 
most providers rely on heavy marketing and this works uh, in terms of awareness but you know the i think the the segments which are underserved uh, still value uh, still value social proof um, suppliers are also generally following the rules uh, terms and conditions are provided but these are often not read as we found out from our demand side interviews often customers would need to access them through a separate link uh, that loads onto a website so it's you know an additional step uh, additional data required it's often in the form of a boast legal speak which intimidates the vast majority of, of borrowers um, and often the the desperate need for credit is is what is driving um, customer decisions. Um, the second point on delinquency and negative listing, uh, I think you know there was sort of uh, most people that we spoke to expressed that uh, this this um, reality of negative listing for very small loans, uh, which define most of digital credits. Um, um, and particularly those who have experienced this themselves uh, shared that the experience turned them away from the product, even if they managed to settle outstanding uh, loans. Um, those who have uh, defaulted in the past expressed awareness about the consequences, but also spoke about the tendency to postpone. Um, they don't see their lenders. So the remote interaction and relationship between lender and user uh, does have an effect of reducing the obligation and the pressure felt to repay the debt. Negatively listed uh, respondents also reported feeling like they have been locked out, not only from the formal financial system, but also other opportunities such as jobs. Um, and, you know, this despair is really compounded, uh, compounded when um, you realize that you're in this situation because of a loan that you took for you know, two dollars or five dollars. Moving on to the third point um, on multiple borrowing and over over indebtedness. Um, this this behavior is largely driven um, by the fact that you know digital credit it's often uh, low value uh, uh, loans, and these loan uh, low loan limits do not match the needs of the providers. Uh, so due to this feature of digital credit, and um, we, we don't think that the incidence of multiple borrowing is always indicative of over indebtedness, um, just because you need to take uh, a few of these loans to meet your, uh, meet your, meet your need. Um, short loan, the product is also associated with short loan tenures. Uh, this puts some pressure on the borrower. Um, and one of the coping mechanisms uh, that, that, that result is that borrow, uh, borrowers uh, borrow from multiple lenders to repay existing loans. On point four, uh, loan decisions and customer behavior, this is perhaps one area where we can make a link to um, how this product is, is maybe empowering. Um, so the borrowers that we spoke to, uh, you know, most of them were quite aware uh, about how to make the system work for them. So uh, they understand what drives loan limits, um, how to increase them. And, you know, this is also a key part of the constant marketing messages that they receive. Um, so a lot of customers we spoke to resorted to borrowing regularly, making uh, early repayments uh, um, to increase their limits. Some of these customers who were regular users of Mshwari or KCB and Pesa, for example, they would increase their savings um, and also their Mpesa transactions um, uh, uh, to increase their loan limits. Point five. Sports betting, uh, it's definitely an issue in Kenya. It's, I think, widely you know, accepted. Uh, it's also now featured uh, in the press and media quite often. Um, when we speak to customers, uh, it's, it's sort of conveyed as a social and leisure activity as opposed to a, a vice. Um, and we see that it's something that's largely driven by peer pressure. 
Um, entry barriers are low. Uh, you can place very small bets and most of this is done uh, on your phone, which is the same medium that is used um, by borrowers to, uh, to access the digital credit. Um, so there is a link between the two activities. Separately, uh, the key demographic which is found to be at risk, which are young males, are also the savviest uh, digital borrowers as we, as we find. So some of the other issues uh, in the market which have a link to client protection and empowerment are um, identity theft and fraud. Um, and this is also a serious concern on the supply side. Most, a lot of the suppliers that we spoke to um, uh, said that it's one of their biggest problems, even more so than defaults. Um, and it's, it's in a way also linked to defaults because effectively how this fraud happens is that fraudsters will steal the info that you would find on IDs, something that's quite commonly available um, in, in buildings and you know, public places in, in, um, in Nairobi, for example, where you need to give, leave this information uh, to apply for loans with no intention of repaying it. So it's not really possible for us to say through this research uh, that you know, X percent of NPLs are um, seeing as a result of, of this fraudulent activity. Um, but we know that loan stacking, which is, which is basically uh, the phenomenon where you take multiple loans successfully in a very short period of time, um, is a good indicator of such fraud. And uh, many suppliers are starting to, to look into this. So earlier we mentioned that you know, um, the user experience was also uh, an important uh, element of the research. And as part of the mock app review exercise that I, I described earlier, we were careful to include lower income and more rural customers um, in, this, in this discussion um, and to also understand how their experience with, with access and usability was. Uh, we looked at four key digital credit products in the market, both USSD as well as app-based. We looked at three key stages, uh, namely registration or sign up, secondly, loan application, um, as well as loan repayment. And um, we found that the challenges were mainly in the first two stages. Firstly, registration were where issues uh, were more around the ease of access. So the high price sensitivity, uh, particularly to data, and then the unstable network connection. We had many uh, respondents, for example, asking us to you know, share data. Um, secondly, what we also found was complexity was an issue. So the lengthy T's and C's uh, did turn people off. Um, uh, certain uh, user interface uh, elements such as the size of the screen, also the, the functionality of the phone in terms of how much memory it has uh, impacts the customer engagement. For loan application, the frustrations were more around the loan uh, limits, which were low. Um, and some users, uh, particularly those who struggled with literacy, got confused with the process and took a longer time. So this, this really brings us to this issue of, you know, um, and this question we asked earlier, which, you know, is there a digital divide? Uh, and I think there is. Um, and um, going back to the point made earlier that, you know, currently most of the borrowers are uh, urban, they're younger, they're more savvy, uh, not necessarily the underserved customers that we hope this product will be making um, uh, an impact on. And I think, as financial inclusion practitioners, what, what gets us excited about this product is that potential. Uh, but we're seeing that there are very, um, some very practical issues that need to be resolved before that's a reality. Um, so one of the, one of the issues is, uh, you know, we, we know that smartphone uptake is increasing, but the, the reality uh, is that majority of these phones, uh, not only in Kenya, but many other developing markets, is that these are low end and hence low functionality phones. Um, so they don't necessarily support the running uh, of uh, many of the fintech apps that we have in the market. Um, users are highly sensitive to the cost of data. 
Um, we also discussed how uh, sometimes navigating the TNC uh, as well as subsequent interfaces in the, in the process of applying for the loan is, is a challenge. Um, and the last point, um, and, and perhaps the most kind of you know, important point uh, uh, in terms of reaching uh, more marginalized or underserved segments is that currently the products that we see in the market are quite standard. So if you look at the table here, um, you see that the loan tenure, the repayment periods are um, quite similar for particularly for the app based ones. Um, and, uh, you know, some of these apps also have, uh, I think we think, I think, you know, some friction is good, but some of these apps also just have too many steps, which, um, which, which complicates things. Um, um, and I think this is something that providers need to uh, put some attention on if the product is really going to serve some uh, real economy needs like agriculture. So the products have to be designed accordingly. Short-term loans um, probably not going to be very helpful to farmers who have seasonal incomes, for example. Um, so. Before I move on to the final part of my presentation, which is the calls of action that we're making, I also wanted to quickly recap the key positives and, and negatives that we shared today. Um, you know, supply of digital credit is increasing, uptake is also increasing. Um, so, you know, we see the potential of the product to impact people. Um, NPLs are decreasing in the last year, uh, last three years, and we hope it continues. Um, unfortunately, defaults uh, are still high. You know, many borrowers are still getting negatively listed. Um, and there are a couple of cu customer protection um, issues that we called out uh, that, that fundamentally need to be addressed, uh, you know, as more and more users uh, get onboarded um, onto this product. In concluding our report, we've made a number of recommendations and we've focused them on two key actors. Firstly, the regulators, uh, and secondly, the suppliers and indirectly also, you know, the investors uh, and the market facilitators uh, that are, support, are trying to support um, the supply side. Um, I'll go through these issues one by one, as well as uh, some of the, the recommendations that we've made to the respective uh, stakeholder. So identity fraud is one. Um, I think a national identity system uh, in, in theory can help. You know, a unique identifier can help address identity fraud, but uh, regulation should also stipulate that photo verification is part of the, the KYC process. Um, some uh, on the supply side, some of them, some suppliers have started doing this. OPESA, for example, does this. Uh, to the suppliers, we say that it's important to combine both traditional uh, uh, methods of verification, including CRB checks, with you know the advanced risk analytics that a lot of suppliers are starting to use to make um, these real-time security de decisions. Um, and you know this this includes a real-time account checking, ID document capture, or, or biometric verification. Uh, a lot of, um, going back to my earlier point about um, loan stacking, a lot of providers uh, such as Tala, for example, is already using algorithms to identify potential cases of fraud uh, in the applications that they receive. On the next issue number two, defaults of very low value loans. Um, uh, the Smart Campaign uh, digital credit standards recommend that um, only loans that have an outstanding balance of um, higher uh, outstanding balance higher than the equivalent of five percent of the monthly uh, GNI per capita uh, be negatively reported. Uh, in Kenya, this corresponds to a figure of approximately six point seven five dollars. Um, I think uh, regulators also need to push suppliers in establishing countermeasures to uh, these defaults. Um, one way of doing this is also monitoring performance of uh, regulators, setting up a dashboard and you know, penalizing failure to meet the established performance standards. Um, 
Secondly, you know, guidelines already ex uh, exist in terms of uh, uh, suppliers having to inform borrowers of def defaults one month prior uh, to it be coming into effect. Um, and I think there needs to be more enforcement of these existing guidelines. Um, and, you know, regulators do also have a responsibility to inform the public by running um, national inform uh, by way of running national information campaigns, uh, for example. Um, so in our demand side conversations, we, we also understood that, you know, people were uh, some, sometimes we, sometimes people were testing products. Um, and because of the small value, they would just try out a product and then forget, forget that they've actually taken the loan. Um, and one way to kind of uh, prevent this from translating into a default and an eventual negative listing, uh, suppliers could actually consider incorporating a tool or a tutorial uh, that's intuitive and user friendly for first time users. Coming then to the point of curbing high defaults, um, regulators should consider defining a threshold value for NPLs, uh, you know, as a percentage of total portfolio, for example. Um, suppliers need to know that they have a responsibility um, as sometimes these trends are also uh, a result of aggressive push, push marketing. Um, suppliers need to seriously use uh, CRB data as part of the loan decision process. Uh, we know, we discussed earlier that a, a subset of suppliers are not regulated, so they don't have to report. Um, and we know from our conversations that many fintechs don't actually use CRB data. Um, I think there needs to be a system that tracks uptake of multiple loans uh, and perhaps, you know, from multiple loans, from multiple carriers, and also start in, start introducing friction uh, before the approval of the nth loan, so the fourth or the fifth loan, whatever is sort of commonly um, uh, agreed as a sign of, of over indebtedness. Um, and uh, the last point is, you know, suppliers need to carry out their obligation of informing defaulters uh, of the risk of negative listing. Um, and also, if they're actually going to be negative listing um, an individual to do that at least a month before the impact. Okay, so the next point is on data protection and privacy. Um, so there are many discussions ongoing uh, on data protection, a couple of bills already in place. I think it's time to now enact that into law, which will provide clarity for everyone uh, and also allow enforcement. Um, on the supply side, uh, it's, I think it's important that uh, suppliers understand that, you know, customer information that's not impacting loan decision um, should not be made available to them. So things like contact lists, especially if the suppliers are using them to shame, uh, shame borrowers. Um, the next point on transparency and pricing, uh, regulators need to enable, uh, you know, a comparable publication of interest rates and fees. Most, the average customer doesn't really know how to compare uh, the different products uh, or is not doing it very comprehensively. Um, for suppliers, we say, you know, please do start moving towards a risk-based pricing pol uh, policy. Um, so uh, rewarding customers for good behavior on uh, successive loans. Um, and we mentioned, for example, Branch is doing this. Um, uh, transparency also relates to, you know, uh, understanding of the product and the liability. And uh, I think there needs to be some action in terms of simplifying both access and language for the terms and conditions. Uh, for example, summary displays can be used before customers accept the loan, uh, you know, and after the loan. So they are aware of what they're signing up to. Um, uh, rather than, you know, pointing them to another link, which, which leads them to a, uh, a lengthy document. In terms of gen general customer protection, to the, uh, I think there are already a lot of, of uh, measures in place on the regulatory front. We would just say uh, these need to be enforced. Um, for the suppliers, we think that uh, for complaints resolution and customer engagement, uh, 
they, there is a need to focus on awareness of these channels um, um, and you know also focus on making them comfortable uh, for people to use. Uh, we also do uh, find some issues with fair and respectful treatment of customers. Many of the digital uh, credit suppliers rely on third party debt collectors. Um, and I don't think that you know, the responsibility ends there. Suppliers should have more control uh, or liability on how these third party um, contractors behave. The next point on data reporting, um, um, I think the regulator has a role in specifying certain internal checks and balances that suppliers have to abide by. Um, and certainly a move towards more real-time reporting will help. Currently, the situation is that, uh, you know, there is a monthly reporting, uh, which is not really um, consistent with the immediate and automated nature of this product. Um, although we do note that there are some reforms already underway uh, in, in this regard. Um, and the last and, and sort of, you know, um, I think founding reason for why we wanted to do this research uh, is their digital exclusion um, uh, happening. Um, on the provider side, uh, there is definitely a need to focus on accessibility, uh, the gaps in the user experience as we described, as well as, you know, customizing the product design uh, to certain uh, core segments such as farmers um, who, you know, have unmet uh, demand for credit. With that, I'm going to end my presentation um, and invite Alex from the Smart Campaign to share some thoughts on how this research has uh, also impacted the development of the digital credit standards. Over to you, Alex. Thanks. Thanks so much, Isfari, um, and thanks to you and, and MSC for this uh, really important research. We were so happy to to support this with the SPTF through the RMF um, facilities. Uh, so before we answer, there are a lot of great questions. Before we answer some of those from the participants, just wanted to make a couple of sm small comments. Uh, for us at SMART, uh, the SMART campaign, these findings could not come at a a more important moment. Um, as we talked about earlier, as more startups are entering the space, as MFIs are trying to compete with their own digital credit offerings, investors are pouring you know, literally hundreds of millions of dollars into uh, fintech's expansion. Um, uh, as regulators are trying to figure how to stay atop of these issues. Um, and for us at the Smart Campaign, we were in the middle of formulating client protection standards for digital credit. Um, with all of this attention, um, it's so important to reorient ourselves and make sure that the client's voice and the client perspective um, is on top of this. And, and I think this report really puts that squarely, um, you know, uh, front and center. And when we look at the report and its findings, what's clear is there's still a lot of work to be done to make sure that there's equity and access to digital credit and that these these products are of good quality, are affordable. Um, effectively, they're, they're being touted as a means and a, an on-ramp for financial inclusion. And uh, we think to achieve that, you know, more needs to be done. Um, and I think it's also important to note, um, one of our takeaways from the study as well was, while the term digital credit is, is used to cover uh, a wide variety of business models, this, the findings here help to kind of nuance that and unpack it, that it's not all apples to apples and some of the issues um, are, are market level, affect all of the different types of providers, but then some of the risks and issues are more particular to say fintechs versus the m and led model. Um, and so I think it's important to, uh, when we use the term digital credit, um, to really understand 
exactly what the business model is, as there are quite a few different um, variations. And there's definitely some encouraging signs from the report uh, uh, and for the for the sector that default, as as Isfari said, default rates are declining for MNO based providers, which have the biggest market share. There's the the formation of the Digital Lenders Association of Kenya, um, which is made up of non regulated fintechs, uh, and they've recently launched a, a code of conduct in June that speaks to a lot of these issues. Um, but there's still a lot of, of work to be done. And I think part of the challenge in collectively advancing uh, as the financial inclusion kind of uh, world is that we're at the frontiers in, in a lot of ways, both from a technology perspective and that we need new solutions like uh, you know, one of the recommendations is is working with the central bank or to have the central bank encourage a central uh, API for credit bureaus to encourage more real-time data sharing. Um, but we're, you know, so that's kind of a technology frontier, but we're also at the frontiers of having a shared understanding of what actually is, is, is responsible. Um, for instance, on pricing, I think we can all agree that APRs that are way into the hundreds are way too high uh, and not responsible. But given that these are largely small short-term loans um, where the interest payments are not being paid over an entire year and where at least in the early initial deployments, the some amount of default is baked into the model uh, to, as the algorithm gets better, you know, where do we draw the line on a responsible price? or given how proprietary the underwriting algorithms are at these at these companies, how can these companies show or prove that they're actively thinking about client debt stress, that they're thinking about over indebtedness, that they're incorporating it into their approach and that they're monitoring it and learning it as they learning as they go and getting better. Um, and I think this report provided invaluable evidence to advance that thinking or having a shared understanding and we were you know, we used a lot of it as input into the 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 recent launch of the of the digital credit standards, um, which can be used for an assessment or evaluation of a of a digital credit provider's um, practices and covers the seven client protection principles. Um, but even in these standards, there's still a lot to learn. You know, as as Isfari recommended or mentioned we we recommend that delinquencies and defaults among uh, among loans below a certain threshold um, uh, don't get reported to the credit bureau or perhaps don't get reported in a way that um, that doesn't result in a penalty or kind of a disproportionate penalty for the client but determining that exact amount thinking at kind of a global level is easier said than done um, but either way we're we're really thankful for this this great research that helped to inform the standards and we hope that in turn these standards can help advance uh, shared understanding of, of good practice and can help stakeholders who are actively working to to kind of achieve the financial inclusion aims of digital credit help them distinguish themselves from those who who um, are not um, and so thanks to MSC and and also an SPTF um, and thanks to everyone who was interviewed for uh, this this project as well, from the you know from the providers themselves to the to the clients. So uh, with that, I think um, we'll uh, uh, turn it to um, we'll we'll start to answer some of the questions. We got a lot from the audience, and so I'm sorry we won't be able to answer all of them, but uh, we will follow up. Um, you know more comprehensively afterwards um, for those that we didn't get a chance to to to, to uh, respond to. So, I think the the first question I wanted to pose is um, uh, Isvari is uh, I think you talked a little bit about this, but there was definitely interest from from participants to understand more behind the multiple borrowing. Why are customers borrowing from more than one digital lender? Is it because they're juggling loans or are they not financially educated? Can you just expand a bit more on kind of the, um, on, on why that's going on? And uh, you also mentioned it could also be a sign of fraud. Yes, so um, there, there are two sort of insights uh, here. You know, one was 
what we got directly from the demand side when we spoke to customers. Um, and, and then I'll also talk about some of the supply side. Um, and with multiple borrowing, uh, at least from the customers, we understand it as, uh, you know, each loan that they, each digital loan that they take is not fulfilling the needs. So as, as, as mentioned, these loans are often small in value. Um, and so they often resort to taking two or three loans uh, uh, to meet the, their needs. Um, there is certainly also, uh, I mean, what we have, we've observed is also there's certainly a phenomenon of people trying out uh, different borrowers. Um, um, but I don't think that necessarily, uh, you know, explains the 62% uh, figure that we talked about earlier. Uh, most of it is just coming from the attribute of the loan. It's a small value loan and you need to take uh, more than one loan uh, to meet your needs. Um, uh, yeah, and, and on the issue of fraud, um, so what, what we found is that, um, um, it's less linked to multiple borrowing, but I think, you know, um, some of the defaults or the high defaults that we're seeing, some of them uh, could be an indication of fraud. Um, so, you know, as, as described earlier, uh, uh, fraudsters basically steal your identity and they create uh, fake profiles and they apply for a loan um, and, and run off. Um, and typically, the patterns are that they would try to do uh, try and make an application for as many loans um, as possible in a short period of time and this is this is what we call loan stacking so this is something that uh, you know suppliers can actually monitor uh, on their systems um, and start uh, start weeding out this sort of activity Great, thanks. Uh, thanks, Isvari. The the next question, um, or kind of a couple of questions uh, combined, there was definitely uh, more interest in understanding kind of gender disaggregated stats. And I think um, for everyone, you can also read, you know, the, Isvari presented a lot of information today, but the full report is uh, several times as big as this slide deck and is just really rich with, with data. But um, uh, participants were wondering uh, the the point you made. I think on on borrowers having up to three loans was that also true for women? Just with the assumptions that uh, women have less access to these products. And there was another question about um, I believe uh, for the supply side uh, data from the credit bureau. How easy is it to track gender um, in that data as well as rural and urban location, um, and is it possible to analyze the loan size and delinquency by these uh, parameters? Um, okay, so the, the data point on three average loans is skewed by, um, you know, the number of loans that uh, an average male takes. Um, I don't have the figure for uh, the number of loans taken by, by women on average. Um, but, but I would say that, you know, women don't, uh, on, on average, they would not have uh, three loans as well. So this, this figure is, is skewed by um, uh, the average figure for the male. Um, and, you know, as, as you have rightly mentioned, uh, this data is from the supply side uh, 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 information, which, which we partnered with a credit bureau uh, to analyze. Um, and gender is certainly one of the fields uh, that suppliers have to fill in. Um, but this is often also a field where we found that data was missing. So we didn't really get into the details of this uh, today, but what we see uh, definitely as an issue is also uh, kind of incomplete reporting by many suppliers, um, which, which, uh, which you know results in missing data and and also impacts our ability to to track uh, some of these indicators uh, more rigorously. As for rural and urban location, that's not something um, that's not something that's being tracked by supply side data right now. Um, 
uh, only gender and date of date of birth, so you can can get a sense of age of of customers. Great. Okay. And uh, just finally, there was a question about whether the fintechs are following smart campaign practices. Um, that is ongoing. Um, we don't have a, kind of a certification program for fintechs, but we do have the digital credit standards, which are being used in evaluations and assessments. And we also have a group called Fintech Protects, um, which actually there are quite a few members from Kenya. Um, and so there's a lot of participation, but sort of measuring their adherence is uh, to the principles is, is still ongoing. Um, and happy to expand on that at another time. So I know we just have a few minutes left. Sorry again, we had uh, a lot of great questions, but we can uh, continue to follow up with, with you. We know who, who asked what, so we can follow up with you um, uh, if need be. And uh, maybe I'll pass it back to Amelia to, to, to close, to wrap things up. Yeah, thank you, Alex. So thank you all again for your questions. I, I do know there were more than we had time to answer and we will do our best to, to follow up. Um, just a few closing thoughts. One is about thinking about how this applies elsewhere. We know so many different countries are struggling now with um, the regulatory environment and um, the, the tension between too much oversight and not enough oversight and and also every player in the ecosystem is struggling with its role in terms of uh, how much information it should be providing what what it can do to create the secure stable market i would like to close with the reflection that sptf has had which is everything that we've done in the past 10 years really around um, social performance management which of course includes client protection and integrating it into how you offer financial products and services really applies in, in the digital context as well. So a lot of the same principles that we've all been working on for so many years, it's not that they suddenly change because the channel through which we're offering our products changes. And I think that is a misconception is that maybe the standards that we've been working on or um, the lessons that we've learned in traditional finance Maybe it's a brave new world with digital finance and, and we need to figure it all out again. But as Alex said, the seven client protection principles really are still 100% valid. And the, the question of how do you create the right culture, how do you create the right governance, um, all the extra elements uh, beyond client protection that the universal standards get into are just as relevant in this market. And we're seeing because there isn't care um, all of these risks. So we just encourage all of you who are thinking of a digital plan um, to, to really start with the same lessons and experience that you have from your more traditional um, backgrounds, which is what are you trying to do for clients? What is your goal? What um, are the problems that you're trying to solve? And then how do you get every single member of your departments on board and doing their part to, to achieve that objective? So thanks again to our speakers, especially to MSC for this excellent research. We do hope that you check it out. I can't remember now that we're, whether we mentioned that um, the report is being translated into French and into Spanish. Um, those translations are uh, in the French, in the case of the French already began Spanish, not quite yet, but certainly by the end of the year, we hope to get those available so you can disseminate them to your partners as well. And of course, the English report is already available. So thanks all, have a wonderful rest of your day, however many hours are remaining in your day, and we look forward to hearing from you more. Goodbye.